Disc jockey, drop the bass. Now the heads. Stand and deliver your attention or your life. The Brexit fuss has entered a new stage recently, and the argument is really over parliamentary sovereignty. This isn't that easy a thing to understand. It relates to a bunch of historical precedents and issues, and I'm going to do my best to explain it, but there's absolutely no way I can do it justice in a short YouTube video with all the various aspects and, and so on. So I would encourage you to do reading for yourself. Uh, there's a few documentaries about some of the things I'm going to bring up that are available on YouTube, so I suggest you go and watch those. So basically, I can't possibly hope to cover everything, and my bias is that I am very definitely a Ramona. So the first thing we have to explain, because you have to define your terms before you go on, is sovereignty. So the word sovereign can have several different meanings. The Queen is the sovereign, even though she has no real political power whatsoever. Parliamentary sovereignty means that Parliament is the final word on the law of the land, over and above everything else. There's some exceptions to that, but by and large, Parliament is in charge. Then there's sovereignty in terms of what a lot of people meant when they voted for Brexit, which means self-rule. So does our country govern itself? That's that's what they were arguing. So those are the terms of sovereignty that we that we have in use. What we're talking about here is parliamentary sovereignty, which means that in Britain, in the United Kingdom, Parliament is the final arbiter of the law of the land. It, it makes the final decisions on everything. Now this relates to Brexit in a couple of ways. Parliament voluntarily has given up sovereignty to an extent in various ways over the years. So by joining the European Community, um, the EU, the European Union, we have deferred certain powers to things like the European courts and so on. So we have voluntarily made the decision to give up some power to other organisations, though we participate in those organisations. So it can be argued that we're still involved in the decision making and therefore Parliament's still involved in the decision making. So still in effect has de facto sovereignty we've also given up certain amounts of parliamentary sovereignty the other way in terms of devolution so we have deferred certain powers to the welsh assembly the scottish assembly and so on but even so parliament remains sovereign it could retract those powers so so the theory goes european law doesn't necessarily respect the concept of parliamentary sovereignty but within the UK and that's what we're talking about Parliament has the final word even over these devolved laws it could supposedly retract them It'd probably cause something of a constitutional crisis but there you go why do we use such a confusing term as sovereignty because Britain runs on tradition and kind of handshake as much as anything else we do have a constitution but it's spread over hundreds thousands of documents statute law and all kinds of other stuff so technically, on paper, the Queen is still in charge. But what actually happens in practice is that Parliament exercises the sovereign's power. Now, technically, the Queen is supposed to sign bills, but what actually happens is that they're signed on her behalf by Parliament. Technically, uh, a monarch could say, no, I don't agree to this law, and that would cause a very brief constitutional crisis, and then it would be asserted that her opinion's irrelevant because Parliament is acting on her behalf, and that, that would be an end to it. So how did we get into this situation? Historically, there's been a tug of war between the monarch and Parliament, or other devolved powers, such as the barons, if you want to go back to the Magna Carta. But the two main things that established parliamentary sovereignty in the UK were the Civil War and the Glorious Revolution. There's a lot of other aspects to these. Um, so you can't just say it's it's about Parliament asserting its power against the king. There's you know Catholicism and Protestantism and a whole host of other bullshit that gets in the way. But really, the war between the Royalists and the Parliamentarians was in part to assert parliamentary power, to say that the king cannot 
rule absolutely and directly without the consent of Parliament. And then the Glorious Revolution later on basically codified that and said, no, Parliament has the absolute last word. So how does this relate to us now? Well, now we have a curious situation in which democracy has gone head to head with ochlocracy. Ochlocracy is mob rule. And democracy and mob rule are not the same. Just because a majority holds an opinion in a democracy doesn't necessarily mean that that opinion must be served by the government of the day. Government in a democratic system is meant to act as a moderation between the will of the mob and what's best for the country as a whole and to protect certain minorities and groups in law. A stark example of this is the death penalty. Um, Restoring the death penalty or keeping the death penalty has long been much more popular, indeed majority popular, in in the British populace. But Parliament has consistently acted to remove it and to not bring it back against the will of the people because it's considered to be unjust and difficult and problematic, to use that word, <laughs> um, and that there's all sorts of issues with it with innocent being, people being put to death and so on. So this is a case of democracy moderating the will of the people. So now we've had this plebiscite, this referendum, this big vote, narrowly deciding to leave the EU. That situation has since been reversed by more than double the margin, according to polls. But people seem to be pressing ahead. Who's pressing ahead? It's not Parliament. It's the executive. The executive is the Prime Minister and the Cabinet. We do not directly elect our Prime Minister. They're not like a President. We do not directly elect our Cabinet either. They're selected by the Prime Minister. And so we've got the mob on one hand in opposition with our democratic representatives who want to have their say in Parliament over Brexit and also in conflict with the executive embodied in the Prime Minister and the Cabinet who also want to push Brexit. This is further complicated by the fact that the referendum was advisory. Referenda in the UK are not considered binding unless it's specifically put into the language. So the Scottish referendum on independence, it was put into the language that this had to be the case if the vote went that way. And similarly, if I remember correctly, was the case with the alternative vote referendum. If that had passed, that would have had to have been passed into law. In all other cases, the referenda are considered advisory and Parliament must still vote. So when we went into the EEC at the, at the time, uh, 1972, if I remember correctly, I'm not fucking off to Wikipedia to, dub to double check. You can cross check me. But anyway, that required a parliamentary vote. So going in required a parliamentary vote. Coming out. The executive, the Prime Minister, wants to just do it without having to consult Parliament. And this has presented something of a crisis. Why is it a crisis? Because it's not particularly clear. Now, under our local laws, British laws, Parliament should have a say for a number of reasons. Uh, the one which seems to be grabbing attention at the moment is that there are statutory rights and things that are extended by our membership to the European community to the European Union, which should, which by precedent, should not be allowed to be repealed without an Act of Parliament. So your rights cannot be taken away without an Act of Parliament. And there are rights that we were given by our membership with the European Union that would be removed if we left the European Union, and that cannot supposedly happen without an Act of Parliament. Parliament also had a say going in. Parliament traditionally has the last word. But the Prime Minister overplaying her hand perhaps from the slim mandate of the ref referendum wants to just go ahead anyway and a wing of the Tory party seems to be wanting to go for a hard Brexit that means we leave everything you know we we don't allow free movement we're no longer tied to any of the economic treaties and so on with Europe and that would well fuck us worse than we're currently being fucked to put it quite frankly now like I say we don't have a president but our style of politics has been becoming far more presidential in the body of the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister and the Executive have been taking more and more power over time. 
since since Thatcher really. Thatcher ruled in a very kind of domineering presidential manner. Blair did the same. And while other prime ministers have not necessarily been as assertive, John Major I'm thinking of, um, Brown as well, that power creep towards the prime minister mirrors the kind of power creep towards the president in the in the US. So much more power has, if not legally, at least socially, been claimed by the prime minister. And now they're attempting to exercise that by by forcing Brexit through against the will of Parliament. So there's a court case going on because this is basically a British constitutional issue now. And it looks like Parliament might get their say. So what's that going to mean? I don't know that Parliament has the balls to go through with refusing Brexit or exercising its power to ensure a soft Brexit. If it overturns Brexit, there is going to be a large portion of the country that are going to be outraged, upset. They're going to claim that it's not democratic, even though it would be within our democratic system. There would likely be violence. There would likely be a lot of MPs lose their seats in the next election. The economy would recover, things like that. But I don't think people would forget it in a hurry. So I don't know... Even though Parliament is very much overwhelmingly two-thirds for staying in the EU, I don't know that they could or would risk their own hides to reverse the decision. Um, I don't see that as being likely. I don't think such an option may even be offered to them. I mean, some amendments might be put in, or they could just stall and blockade, but that wouldn't be good for us in the long run. So that's one one side of it. But they do need to have, have their say. And that would be an important reclamation of power back from the executive. For my money, what I expect to happen is that the court case will uphold that Parliament has to have their say in some degree, but that degree will not be huge. It might soften Brexit a little and reclaim some power back from the executive. But this is incredibly interesting if you're a politics and history wonk like me. Um, even as the pound crashes and poor people get fucked over by inflation and various other issues, you know, on the one hand, it's kind of nice to be the, you know, the wife sat in the car saying, well, I told you you should have stopped and asked for directions. Now we're lost and about to be eaten by wolves. Hmm. You know, there's a certain smugness to disaster happening around you that you've predicted. And it's interesting for all these reasons that I've said, but overall I wish this just hadn't fucking happened. At all. And people seem to have their heads in the sand about how much damage it's causing, how much damage it's doing. But politically, historically, it's super interesting. Zang. If you like what I do here, please like, subscribe, share on your social media, and if you feel so inclined you can support me on patreon at grimachu my main website is postmortemstudios.wordpress.com there or on twitter you can keep up with me and everything that i'm doing